Have you ever wanted to know what's it made of? Most of us with any degree of curiosity have asked that question many times. The answer to that question usually involves some kind of chemical analysis. The list of chemical analytic techniques is a long one indeed, but most of these techniques involve some kind of serious drawbacks. Problems with some of these methods include a small range of applicability, the need for a well-equipped lab and detailed knowledge of chemistry, very expensive precision equipment involving high vacuum, high voltage, x-rays, plasmas, etc. One of my too many interests is geology, and a friend found a rock that he thought was eclogite. Now, eclogite would be a very interesting find, and I had my doubts, so I sent a sample off to an igneous petrologist at a state university. After a year and a half, I still have not received a reply. In the meantime, I began to explore the possible ways to do this for myself. I looked at various possible methods, and not having a strong background in chemistry, and seeing the cost of basic lab equipment, I rejected wet chemistry. The next one I explored was spectroscopy. Flame spectroscopy seemed promising, but to do it one has to atomize the sample in a very high temperature flame, and the range of identifiable elements is somewhat limited. Spark spectroscopy came up next, but it too has problems. Mass spectrometry, electron microprobes, X-ray diffraction, etc., were all rejected on the basis of cost. There was one technique that finally passed through the filter. That was LIBS. Laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy seemed like it just might work. The more I read about it, the more intrigued I became. And when I read about the Mars Curiosity rover ChemCam, I was sold. Basically, how LIBS works is that you hit an unknown substance with a very short pulse of extremely powerful radiation which vaporizes a tiny amount of the target. That vapor is heated to an extremely high temperature, and in that process, the molecules are largely disassociated into atoms, and the atoms are ionized. The vapor plume expands at supersonic velocity and begins to cool and emits species-specific radiation, as in flame spectroscopy. This light is then collected and analyzed, as in the usual forms of spectroscopy. Let's have a look at it. I have spent just over a year now tinkering with this contraption, and I am very pleased with the results. That doesn't mean that it's finished. There is a lot to be done yet. The device looks sort of complicated. That's because in the beginning I really had no idea what the final design would actually look like, and I knew if I made a change somewhere it might require changes elsewhere, therefore I made everything adjustable. It will be made more compact and all those adjustments are no longer needed. The red box contains the main laser and a low power targeting laser. On its output end, is the converging lens mounted in three pieces of PVC pipe. The lens is a simple biconvex lens about 25 millimeters in diameter and 50 millimeters focal length. The table is made from a piece of thread stock and a coupling nut, which was epoxied to a piece of plastic from an electrical junction box so that when the knob on the top is rotated, the table raises or lowers to accommodate samples of different thickness. The mirror at the back is a spherical, not parabolic mirror, designed to capture as much light as possible and project it onto the slit of the spectrometer. The spectrometer itself is a simple device built of several pieces of PVC plumbing hardware, a couple of razor blades, and a piece of pre-recorded DVD. The power supply is built in a wood box, a bad idea that will soon be changed and involves a microwave oven transformer with a 40-turn extra winding added and some capacitors, diodes, and voltage regulators. Let me describe some of the spectra I've taken with this gadget. 
I've been on a scavenger hunt for the last several weeks. Where possible, I've tried to find reasonably pure elements. In a few cases, that's relatively easy. For example, electrical copper is usually at least 99% pure copper. The content of coins is often fairly pure and is usually well documented. In most cases, however, it's difficult to know with any certainty what something is composed of. One can buy relatively pure samples of many elements, but this can be expensive, so I have resorted to chemical compounds. In that case, I try to get several different compounds of the same element. For example, calcium chloride, calcium carbonate, and calcium sulfate are all relatively easy to obtain, and in these, the cations are all the same, calcium, while the anion, chloride, carbon, and sulfate are different. So it is easy to determine which lines belong to calcium and which belong to the anions. Also notice that these anions produce rather weaker lines. Elements in the upper right portion of the periodic chart don't perform well with libs. Let us go back for a moment to the eclogite. Eclogite, which can only form at high temperature and pressure, is typically composed of garnet, omphacite, and kyanite. I had no problem with garnet and omphacite. They were obvious. It was kyanite about which I had my doubts. So one of the first real samples I tested once the spectrometer was working was the kyanite. Kyanite is composed of silicon, aluminum, and oxygen. Here it is compared to the spectra for aluminum and silicon as well as a known sample of kyanite. Well, my friend was right. It is very probably eclogite. I've begun to accumulate a pretty fair library of spectra. In fact, I have spectra now for most of the common rock forming elements and I want to expand it. In fact, I hope to interest others in contributing. Can you have one of these gizmos? You bet you can. How expensive is it? Well, that depends on what you want. If you want a professional grade laboratory instrument and have unlimited moolah to spend because you've submitted a politically correct research proposal and Uncle Sam is funding it, go elsewhere. These things are hot and lots of people are selling them. If, however, you are a poor peasant like me, you can easily do it yourself for, say, $300 or less. The most expensive part was the laser, and mine cost $195. I also bought the pulse forming network and the trigger transformer for about $35 each because these were designed for this laser and were the simplest solution for me.